All right, good afternoon, everybody. So today we have the Sioux, one of, one of the great tribes, probably the great tribe of the Northern Plains. If you want to get a handout, we got handouts right there. But of course, I have to tell you what I forgot last week. Um, and this was uh, something important. I was, I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I missed this, although I went way over like I sometimes do. And by the way, I'm going to try really hard to finish on time. So, uh, let me write that down. <laughs> The trouble is I don't have a watch. I have to look at the screen here for the time. Hello. There is a hand out. So last week we were talking about the Cherokee. Um, I had mentioned John Ridge and his father, Major Ridge, had spent time in Washington, D.C. Uh, and on the East Coast schmoozing with uh, important people to uh, – uh, push their cause, and um, there's one really great speech that John Ridge gave before Congress um, uh, in, in a plea to keep their lands. So this is an excerpt from that. You asked us to throw off the hunter and warrior state. We did so. You asked us to form a Republican government. We did so. Adopting yours as a model. You asked us to cultivate the earth and learn the mechanic arts. We did so. You asked us to learn to read, and we did so. You asked us to cast away our idols and worship your God. We did so. But they were kicked out anyway. And this was, you know, the, the great tragedy of the Cherokee is that more than any other tribe, they wanted to be like the white people around them, and they tried to uh, assimilate, and yet they were kicked off anyway. So, um, oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention was that um, I had uh, mentioned that uh, John Ross's, he was the, the chief, uh, the head chief of the Cherokee, his brother had organized the uh, all of the Cherokee going out west, and he was paid handsomely for it by the government to uh, organize that whole trip, which was a disaster. But he, he made an awful lot of money, and so he spent that money on buying 500 slaves from the east to ship them west to sell them to the Cherokee that he just helped move over. So. Interesting bit there. And uh, one other thing was that uh, some of you may know this. Uh, Sam Houston was actually raised for a few years, uh, three, three years during his teen years. Uh, he lived with the Cherokee and uh, learned the language and became uh, one of them before he went on with his life. Um, so now the Sioux. The Sioux. Uh, in the Northern Plains, uh, the most dominant tribe uh, in history in the Northern Plains. And there is a, a large body of literature to choose from. And, um, and so I, I had a hard time because there's so much out there. And, and I bought quite a number of books on the Sioux. I've gone through about half of them. So these are the books. Uh, kind of an extensive bibliography today. Oh, and by the way, who knows who this is? Crazy. Sitting Bull, the greatest of the Sioux. Don't forget your handouts. Handouts. Thank you. Just, just as a side note, um, I have handouts every single week. <laughs> you forget every single week. I have to remind you. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm starting out with a nice short biography. They're, they're always fun. 
Uh, this is on Crazy Horse. Uh, it's only 148 pages. Uh, a good short uh, introduction to Crazy Horse, um, if that's uh, what you'd like. Um, I mentioned before that if you want to uh, get a, a good overall picture of Native Americans, you really need more than just uh, kind of the textbook look or even biographies. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating to read firsthand accounts of people who lived with uh, the Native Americans or the Native Americans themselves. So this first one, Charles A. Eastman was raised as a Sioux until he was 15. And um, so, and he was a Sioux, I'm not saying he wasn't, but uh, he, was, he was raised, uh, he was born uh, 1863, and so he lived uh, for his first 15 years uh, with his people. And then uh, he, his father uh, wanted to, as, they, as everybody was being sent off to the reservations, his father bought a farm and said, we're not going to live on a reservation. You're coming with me to live on a farm. So anyway, but uh, as he grew up, he got an education, and uh, he married a white woman, and together they wrote out his experiences uh, as a child, as, uh, as a Sioux uh, out on the plains. And this is absolutely fascinating reading. The thing that stands out to me about this particular book uh, was that he said, you know, a lot of people have this idea that Indians are all very stoic and serious all the time. He said, when I was a kid in the teepees talking with the elders and everybody getting together, I have never in my life experienced so much laughter as among the Indians. It's you white people who are much more uptight than the Indians. On this next one, uh, Black Elk Speaks. This was a, a really big book uh, back in the 60s when you, it, he had the, the radical uh, hippie movement. Uh, they took to this book because this, it, this was guy, it's kind of a medicine man, talks about his experiences as a very young uh, boy uh, growing up among the Sioux. And as a teenager, he was there um, when Custer attacked, and maybe he was there at Little Bighorn, and he talk, talked about his experiences as a young boy. He didn't go out onto the uh, go out to attack the soldiers, but he was back there in camp, and uh, and he saw uh, some very fascinating things. Uh, some of the women who went out to attack the soldiers too, uh, killing people who were wounded or whatnot. And uh, he actually got his first scalp, he said, mm -hmm. from a wounded soldier that uh, he was told, go get that scalp. And so he uh, scalped the guy. Um, this next one, uh, Samuel W. Pond, the Dakota Sioux. Uh, this is in Minnesota. He was a missionary to the, uh, to the Sioux tribe in Minnesota. And so um, he lived with them for about 17 years. And what's great about this book is that he knew a lot of different people, and he describes them and their personalities. Uh, he has a long list of chiefs that he just takes one right after the other, and he talks about them and what kind of a chief they were. And it's, this is ordinary, mundane stuff that you don't usually see in any uh, book about Native Americans. And that's what makes it fascinating. Um, so uh, he'll talk about one particular chief who was a very good chief and everybody respected him and followed his advice and, and, uh, and it was, he did very good for his small village. He'll talk about another chief that uh, nobody ever paid attention to. And, but, he, 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 but he was still chief but he was chief in name only. They respected him, uh, the title, but they didn't listen to him. There were others in the tribe, or in that village, that they would listen to who were the real leaders. Uh, and then other chiefs, another chief might be just a lazy bum that nobody liked. 
uh, but nobody did anything about it. And another one uh, might lose his position by someone else uh, taking over and just saying, uh, follow me instead of him. And, and chiefs could be replaced, but it's usually uh, not an official act. It's everybody following somebody else instead of the chief, and then they say, you know, you're not chief anymore. So uh, a lot of stuff like that. And he talks about uh, ordinary life, uh, the role of women, which is something that always fascinates me. Um, and he talks about how in this society, in, this, in Minnesota at the time that he was right, or the time that he was with them, and this is the 1830s, 40s, um, and up to 51, I believe. And he said that this was not so much the warrior society that the Great Plains Sioux were. So they're a, a bit more settled uh, than the, the more, their more wild brethren out on the plains. But uh, it was interesting to him to, to notice how men and women got along. And he said there were terribly abusive men who would beat their wives. But he also said, I noticed a number of men who had very, uh, who were henpecked by their wives. Oh. And uh, their wives ruled the roost and, uh, and told them what to do. So he, he and, and the wide spectrum of everything in between. So that was a really good book too. Um, th this next one, Red Cloud. Many of you may not have heard of this name. This is a name you really should know. Uh, possibly the greatest warrior uh, of the Sioux, Red Cloud, and I'll be talking about him more later. I was expecting to be really excited by this book, and I wasn't. I was a bit disappointed. And I think part of it was, uh, this, it's his autobiography, but in recording it, he tells the, his story to the translator. The translator tells it to the guy who's writing it down. And so it's, it's a bit distant. And, and he doesn't talk about uh, the, uh, the battles in depth with white people. He was too afraid to. And he probably had no reason. So it's still well worth, well worth reading, but it just wasn't as exciting as I had anticipated. Another book that, um, or another type of book that's always fascinating is the captivity books. And there are a lot of them out there. Uh, this one, Fanny Kelly uh, wrote in 1872 about uh, her experience being captured by the Sioux. Uh, her family, some of them were killed. Uh, they were traveling out onto the plains. Uh, they were attacked. And um, some of his, her family were killed. Some of them escaped. Uh, but she was captured. And she was uh, held for a number of months uh, as kind of the wife slash slave of one of the men of the tribe. She said, she claims that she was very fortunate that the man who claimed her was in his 70s. <laughs> that way she wasn't raped over and over again. So, um, but it was, it, it was a fairly common thing if you were a woman uh, being captured by the Sioux, you would be gang raped, and we'll talk about that later. Um, she said that she was not. So, uh, but yeah, fascinating reading, her talking about uh, all the labors, uh, working on uh, uh, skinning hides and, and uh, tanning them, and uh, getting along with the man's other wives who didn't like her much. Uh, but there was also, there's always, in these captivity stories, there's always someone or groups of people who felt very protective of these captives and showed great compassion too. Uh, this next one, uh, Robert Utley, The Lance and the Shield, The Life and Times of Sitting Bull. So, um, Mr. Utley, uh, in his introduction, says that he wants his book to be the standard for uh, biographies of Sitting Bull. Uh, he looks back to the previous book that he looked up to as, as the great work. Um, 
And in reading the, the book, uh, he set his own standard a bit high, I think. Uh, it is a good book. It is good scholarship. It is worth reading. Um, now, I'm, not, I'm no expert. I can't tell you if it's the best book out there on Sitting Bull, uh, but I kind of hope it isn't, uh, mainly because it's not a great book. It is a very good book. I would hope that the best of them is a great book. Uh, but still, it, it is a good book. This next one, if I was to pick uh, the, the best or most exciting of the books, I think I would pick this one. The Heart of Everything That Is, The Untold Story of Red Cloud. This is just an exciting story. This guy knows how to write to make it interesting and exciting. Uh, so, and this is, again, Red Cloud is, is a name you really should know. Uh, it's, it's just odd sometimes, the names that come out as, as famous and others do not. And uh, this next one, Royal B. Hastrick, the Sioux. This is kind of um, your basic kind of a textbook look at the Sioux. It's not uh, fun summer reading, but it is uh, a very important work because it gives you a, a really good overview of the, uh, the manners, the morals, the customs, and things like that of the Sioux. And so it, it's interesting in that sense. This next one, Francis Parkman, if you are into history, Francis Parkman is a name you should know. Uh, he was in the 1800s. Uh, he's probably known as one of the great, uh, if not the greatest American historian of the 1800s. And, um, and if you read anything that he has written, you'll know why. He's just a great person to read. And his own personal story, he went out to the Plains in 1846 so he could see for himself to live among the Indians and see what that is like. And that's what this story is about. Uh, when I first saw this, the Oregon Trail, I was thinking, well, this is someone who's traveling to Oregon, right? Well, he doesn't. He traveled on the Oregon Trail to the, the Great Plains and stopped and spent some time in various uh, Native American tribes. But this is just a great work, and um, it, it's very personal, and he gives his opinion. One of the great things about Francis Parkman is his opinions about stuff. He'll take an individual and, um, and give his honest opinion, uh, which is sometimes very cutting, uh, sometimes very uh, praise, uh, praising some particular person, but uh, it's always interesting. This next one, uh, for the same reason, I would highly recommend this. George Caitlin is known primarily as an artist. He went out in the 1830s to spend time among the tribes in, on the Great Plains, and he spent time among many different tribes. And he, as an artist, he painted portraits of them. Uh, very famous now for that. But he also wrote about his experiences. And again, uh, just fascinating look at various individual personalities, uh, the customs of various tribes on a uh, first-hand basis. A great book. And this last one, um, Son of the Morning Star, Custer and the Little Bighorn. I knew I had to put this in here. Um, I gotta confess I haven't read this book, but the reason I'm putting it here is because um, when you do read about uh, the Little Bighorn, uh, the, the author will usually look back to this book as a source because this, when it came out in 1984, uh, it surpassed everything before it. And scholars today look to this book as the seminal work on uh, Little Bighorn. Question? Yes? The names Red Cloud and the Crazy Horse, are those truncated versions of longer names? or Not that I know of. Um, now, Crazy Horse had a different name early on. Um, I, I, it's escaping me right now. Uh, it was actually his father's name that he took when he became an adult. <coughs> but uh, no, that's, I've never heard that it's a longer version, or there is a longer version. Yes? Uh, what about Bury My Heart of Wounded Knee? You know what? Um, I haven't read that, and I'm, I'm, 
kicking myself because I know that's a, a really big work that a lot of people know of, and I know I've got to read that sooner or later. And I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I just don't know about it. I, I, I know of it, and I've seen it, and I'm kicking myself because I've seen it so many times in like thrift stores. That's where I, that's where I get a lot of my books. And I've seen it time and time again, and I, I just kind of pass by. And, uh, and now I think I, I should have gotten that. Uh, it's, do you know anything about it, or, or are you just? I did heard? read it a long time ago, and all I can say is, I think I'm gonna make you ashamed of your wife. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's kind of kind of the impression that uh, that I have of it. And there are a number of books that are kind of like that. And um, I, I I just want to say honestly that um, there there is. A person that I have great respect for once uh, made that comment that um, sometimes when you think of the history of white people and, and the broken treaties and promises and the, the, uh, the killings and the, the mistreatment and the, all of the injustice that you say, you know, it kind of makes you feel ashamed to be white. And, uh, and I, I understand that, that feeling. Um, what I try to do in, in studying and talking about uh, Native Americans is, is to give the point of view that there are no good guys and bad guys. Whoever you may think of as the good guy or the bad guy, um, I, I think that's, that's not the right paradigm. Um, I think uh, as we get into you know, this week and next week, we're going to look into tribes who were who treated other tribes very badly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a very human story. This isn't a story of bad guys beating up on good guys. Right. This is two, a clash of cultures. Uh, one power is greater than the other, and uh, that's the way I, I usually try to look at this. I I try to be forgiving of everybody. Uh, so, so um, the Sioux, um, they were, uh, if you go past 1500, uh, some will tell you that they may have uh, been in the Carolinas. I, I've taken that out because I, I'm not entirely sure of that, but that's, that's what I've heard. Uh, and from the Carolinas, they went up to Minnesota. And that's where we know of them at first, Minnesota, Wisconsin area. Uh, so, and uh, Sioux, by the way, is a Chippewa word. Uh, and the Chippewas did not like them. Uh, they called them little snakes. And that's, uh, so the French translate that into Sioux. So that's why the weird spelling. Um, they call themselves the people of the seven council fires. Um, I, I was going to try to explain the various divisions of the Sioux, but it seems like every time I read about it in any particular source, it was different from every other source that I read. So until I feel a lot more confident about how they were divided up, I'm not really even going to get into that. Uh, suffice it to say, I'm going to talk about the Lakota Sioux primarily uh, this, in this lecture. Uh, uh, there is, and then you talk about the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota split three different groups. Originally, that was supposed to be one word uh, and just three different pronunciations of the same word. And that's, again, that's one source that I've been told from. Uh, it gradually became three larger groups. Uh, just because they were in different spots and they pronounced that same word differently. Uh, but anyway, we're going to be talking about the Lakota Sioux primarily, and they were divided up into uh, seven bands. Uh, Oglalas, Brules, Papas, uh, and I, I'm sure I'm going to be butchering these words, but uh, uh, many Conjus, Sans Arcs. Anybody know what that means? Without, Without your bow. <laughs> yeah. Sands, of course, means without, you don't have arcs, the arc of the bow. So uh, this came about uh, at, at some time when this particular group 
uh, were told to leave their bows behind to come to a meeting or something like that, and that's how that originated. Uh, two Kettles and Blackfoot, not to be confused with the Blackfoot Indians uh, out in the further west. Uh, this, the Blackfoot Sioux, or the Blackfoot Lakota, uh, were, were part of the Lakota tribe. Uh, the Blackfoot Indians uh, elsewhere were further west. And, of course, they were a hunter-gatherer. Um, we suspect that they may have, earlier on, been a farming people uh, somewhat, uh, hunter-gatherer and farmers, uh, but uh, as they went out to the prairie, uh, they gave up their farming. So, of course, they hunted deer, buffalo, bear, smaller game. Um, and before you have horses, if you are hunting buffalo or bison, the more technical term, um, you have particular ways of doing it. You can try to sneak up on them like this and shoot them with your bow and arrow, or you just run them off a cliff. Um, so anytime I, uh, I, I hear someone say very authoritatively that Native Americans always used every bit of everything that they killed. They did not want to waste uh, the smallest morsel. And so uh, that's what they always did. Anytime anyone tells you always anything, they're usually wrong. I think a more correct way of seeing it is Native Americans could use every bit of everything that they killed. They had a use for the bones, the sinews, of course they ate the meat, uh, the, the skins, and pretty much everything about the kill could be used. It does not mean that every single time any Native American ever killed something that they used every little bit of it. And this is one example. When you, when you herd a whole bunch of buffalo off a cliff, you, you're usually going to get a lot more than you need. And so the rest of it is just left. And, and of course we know this too because on some of these sites, a whole lot of bones are left for archaeologists to dig up. These bones were not used uh, by the Native Americans. So this is how the buffalo hunt looked at first. And then they get horses. And it becomes a lot more fun to hunt buffalo. Um, and this, of course, I, I wanted to find a picture of uh, someone hunting on a horse, shooting with a rifle, and I couldn't find one. But uh, this is good enough, I suppose. So uh, once you're there, you had European contact, a lot of things change. When did they get horses? Yeah, that's what I was, I was okay. uh, I'll get to that. So, in the culture, to an extreme degree, and this is true of many different tribes throughout uh, North and South America, generosity is one of the great virtues, uh, to the extent that uh, on certain occasions, uh, particular families would give away literally everything that they had. And in, in the case of the Sioux, there is a particular ceremony if a family, say, lost a son, a son who died for whatever reason, they throw uh, kind of a celebration, not exactly a celebration, but they have a gathering where they throw a feast for everybody. And in that gathering, they give away all of their possessions even the clothes off their backs as kind of a symbolic gesture that they're giving away, that they're kind of giving up everything. Now, since they live in a society in which giving is one of the greatest virtues, naturally they're going to be giving stuff back again. So it's not like they're just going to go around naked for the rest of their lives. <laughs> but uh, but it was, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing about many Native American tribes the extent to which they believe uh, deep in their soul 
that they are not to gather together a lot of possessions, that they uh, must give away to the needy, to the poor. And uh, one of the great shocking things that many of them would state when, it, when they were uh, taken on trips to uh, the East Coast to see the huge cities of the white people, that uh, they would notice that there are homeless people who are hungry on the streets. And they say, that would never happen amongst us. Uh, they, they just didn't understand that at all. And, uh, and of course, uh, in such a culture, uh, those who give away the most are the, the most esteemed. Now, um, it's also true that when you are out on the prairie and you are a warrior tribe, the belongings that you are gathering have been stolen from other tribes. So, mm -hmm. which is an in interesting uh, bit too, because uh, anyone who, will, who has lived amongst the uh, Native American tribes will tell you that theft is just unknown, almost completely unknown amongst their tribe. But they make their living by stealing from other tribes. <laughs> And again, uh, as far as uh, uh, another very important virtue is honesty. Honesty amongst your tribe is very, very important. Deception towards other tribes is also very important. <laughs> so that's they must really love the white man. Yeah. So a warrior culture, the Sioux, as all uh, tribes out on the plains must have been. Uh, they were a warrior culture. The Sioux just happened to be the best. Um, so here's a number of the tribes that they uh, would fight with. Um, uh, this first one, can anyone take a shot at that? At the Sini Boines, something like that? Yeah, we'll go with that one. That sounds good. Uh, yeah. Pawnee, Iowa, Chippewa, Kiowa, UT. Arikaras, Omahas, and, the, and most of all the Crow. Apparently, um, from what I understand, uh, nobody liked the Crow. They were fighting everybody. Usually, uh, a tribe would, would have allies as, where, as well as enemies, but it seems the Crow were the ones that everybody disliked the most. Um, uh, for the Sioux, it was the Shawnees who were their uh, allies, kind of, a, kind of like the younger brother sort of tribe to them because they were a smaller tribe. Um, so as the Sioux came out onto the Great Plains, and this is the late 1700s, uh, they took over from the Crow uh, the Dakotas. And so the Black Hills uh, were taken from the Crows in late 1700s, and immediately almost uh, became very sacred to them. Because in the Black Hills, and I, I'm kicking myself, I, I should have brought up that should have put up a picture of this. Uh, there are the, uh, the caves out there that are literally uh, well over 100 miles of caves with a fairly narrow opening. Now, has anyone ever visited there, the, the caves? And, so what, is, uh, what do you notice about those caves when you are there? It was 50 years ago. OK. Well, what you're supposed to notice is that it's breathing. Because yeah, anytime, right. what? Caves breathe. Yeah, because of air pressure. Yeah. All of the air that's in there, uh, if the air pressure is very low outside, then the air is coming out. If the air is very high on the outside, then it will be pushing in. So uh, to someone who's, you know, if you're a Native American and you don't know about air pressure, you see this cave as breathing. And so that became, for the Sioux, where uh, the place where their gods created them and brought them <coughs> up out of the earth. So it became very sacred to the uh, Sioux very quickly. So here's an interesting uh, custom. As a warrior tribe, uh, warfare is very individualistic to 
uh, virtually all Native American tribes. There is some organization to it, but for the most part, when you are in battle, you are fighting for yourself, and you are fighting for the glory of it. Uh, of course, you want to steal horses and whatever goods, maybe some women and children, and, and you want to kill the enemy. But most important is for you to uh, do what is called a, a counting coup. And so uh, you actually don't even have to kill the enemy to get credit here. What you have is a coup stick. And if you, all you do is touch someone, one of the enemy men, uh, you get credit as one coup. Now, if you kill someone, and you're the, you're the first one to touch him, you've killed him, someone else might come along and be the second one to touch him. And so they get credit as second coup, and third, and fourth. So when you go back to your tribe and talk about all of your great deeds, and that is what you do, by the way. Modesty was not a virtue <laughs> among the Sioux, or probably any uh, uh, Great Plains tribe. When you, when you are done with your great deeds, and you go back to your village, you brag about it, and you do that for days. You tell anyone who will listen to you what exactly you did, and your great bravery and courage in uh, defeating or killing or get, getting scalps or whatever. And uh, yeah, so even if the person that you touched was never killed, you still get credit. Hopefully someone else has seen this too, so you have a witness and they will bear witness that you have, yes, you got a coup there. Uh, but uh, yeah, and it's up through fourth, you get credit. And this is a coup stick, rather harmless stick. And, and all it is meant to do is to touch someone. So, uh, better to kill the person than not, but you, you're, for your credit as a brave in your tribe, uh, you get, uh, you get the, the counting the coup, and people look up to you for that. And sometimes, actually, if you did not kill the person, it may be seen as even a greater uh, thing because uh, the person was alive and you touch them. It's a very dangerous thing getting that close to another tribe's uh, warriors. So for you to touch him, to be so close as to touch him and you got away, that counts as something, a great, brave deed. The person who wants to touch him have a demerit or something? <laughs> I don't know. That, that would be interesting. The, the other tribal members say, oh, he touched you, I saw that. Yeah. He said, no, he missed me, he missed me. But anyway, the coup stick uh, doesn't have to look exactly like this. It just has to be a stick. Everybody's going to probably decorate their own in their own way. But this is just an example of a coup stick. And then, of course, I have to come to the more gruesome aspect of uh, warfare. Uh, the torture of prisoners. Now, I have talked to you about how they... Uh, would take a prisoner back to their camp and slowly torture them over two or three days um, uh, today. And, they, and the Sioux, of course, did that as well. But more commonly for uh, white people, if there was a, a big battle and uh, they knew that they had to leave fairly quickly, uh, they would spend a lot less time. They would torture whoever was wounded or, or was captured, and then they would leave. Uh, and, and you know, kill them first and then leave. So the torture would only be maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, up to an hour or so, which is a whole lot better than two or three days, but still it must have been awful. So I, I mentioned last week that uh, we're gonna get even worse uh, among the Sioux as far as torture goes. And uh, there was really no uh, boundary when it came to inflicting pain on your enemies. Uh, nothing sacred, and the more gruesome, the better. The more painful and humiliating, the better. And I know that you're reading up there right now uh, what uh, would sometimes take place. One of the more common things that uh, they would do to men is to cut off their genitals, 
shove it in their mouth. Ugh. That was seen as a great humiliation. Now, also, uh, they were thinking of the afterlife. In the afterlife, uh, the Sioux afterlife, of course, is hunting and making warfare and enjoying women and eating food. So, your enemies, you don't want to enjoy any of those things. So you cut off their hands and feet so that they cannot run and hunt. You cut off their tongue so that they cannot enjoy food. You gouge out their eyes. You cut off their genitals so that they can't have women. All of these things were, had a purpose. And, and I, I want to emphasize again, that when they did this, this is not just something that they would go through because they're supposed to. <coughs> they really did enjoy it. Oh. One, of the, one of the more gruesome aspects of Native American life. But it was, as I say, this is a celebration. They have just defeated their enemies, and they're going to enjoy it. And one of the, one of the worst ones I heard, a description of uh, it, on one particular battlefield, they, they uh, ripped out the intestines and wrapped it around like two or three guys. And uh, presumably it was done while they were still alive. And uh, so this is about the worst I could come up with as far as pictures go. It's bad so, enough, that's all right. Yeah, it's bad enough. Thanks. That's not so different from drawing and quartering people. So, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Because uh, someone mentioned to me last week about in Europe, uh, torture was a, a very common thing as well. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the earliest descriptions of Native American torture was from a, 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 a what was it, a priest who was among the uh, Iroquois. And he sat in on one of their ceremonies uh, where they were burning a man to death, a, a neighboring tribal uh, enemy. And so this priest uh, sat in and watched the whole thing. And the book that I was reading, uh, the author uh, ex ex explained that, well, the priest would not have uh, been bothered too much by this. This is the 1600s, probably early 1600s. Um, he would not have been too bothered by it because he's probably seen similar uh, types of torture in Europe. So, uh, yeah, it, it is good to note that uh, torture is not something that just the Native Americans did. Uh, although, as Europe progressed, it became less and less of a thing uh, for yeah, European culture. <coughs> Drawn and quartered. Yeah. What's it so, for? So it's basically uh, four horses, arm, one arm, you know, arm and arm, leg, leg. So that's being drawn out. Oh. And so you have four horses each pulling in different directions. Oh. Yeah. If, if you get into medieval torture and uh, uh, the Spanish Inquisition and you know, lots of, or even. Uh, the, uh, the Reformation period and the wars, uh, the witch trials, all of that stuff, they became very creative also in uh, uh, inflicting pain. Okay, moving on. Uh, tribal chiefs, and, and again, this is fairly common in, among many <coughs> tribes, uh, the, uh, the position as chief uh, could be inherited, but it wasn't all, it wasn't uh, necessarily inherited. You still had to earn it. You were the son of the chief. Uh, you were expected to become the next chief, but if you were not up to the job, uh, you would not have the job. Um, it was really the tribal councils that were the most important authority uh, for making decisions, and the decisions had to be unanimous, usually. And so they would spend a lot of time. Uh, they would always start out, they get together, and they smoke their pipes. That was something that was almost universal too. You get together, everybody's smoking a pipe, and you spend time just sitting there and smoking.
before anybody starts to talk. And then they discuss the issues. The chief uh, would naturally have, uh, would carry more authority than most, uh, but he is not the final word. It is the, the council uh, that discusses amongst themselves whether they want to go to war against somebody or whatever decisions uh, they need to make. And they did have a type of police force uh, that was the uh, Akachita, I believe it's pronounced. Um, and these were semi-official positions. And they're mainly used to, uh, uh, if your uh, tribe, your village, is moving from one place to another, they help organize it. If there's any arguments amongst uh, various people, then they help settle that so that it makes for a more organized and efficient way of uh, packing up everything and traveling on. What did they smoke? Tobacco, yeah. So no uh, hallucinogenics and they all sat around having bright ideas? Right, it was, it was not it was hallucinogenics. It was tobacco. Yeah. And, it, and generally it was not marijuana either. It was tobacco, as we know. Probably, um, not as nice a tobacco as we would recognize. Not that I have not, I've never smoked it. Uh, but it was tobacco. Uh, Sioux women, of course, did all the drudge work. Uh, they did all the packing and carrying when, there was, uh, when they had to move. And they did have to move uh, fairly frequently. When you're out on the plains and you depend upon the buffalo, uh, you have to move. You cannot stay uh, in one place uh, permanently. Uh, they prepared all the hides and the food. Um, sometimes women would fight in battles. Usually if there was a raid on their village, uh, the women would come out with clubs and go after the, uh, the raiders. That's usually how that would work. Um, they were usually bought as wives from the family. It was not seen as a shame, though, and the women uh, would, actually, would often uh, take great pride in how much was paid for them to their father. Um, <clears throat> they were occasionally, there were forced marriages. And this is something uh, that was brought out in, in the book that I, I read on uh, the guy who was a missionary. Uh, he noticed that the uh, suicide rate for women was actually higher than for men. And it was usually because uh, a girl uh, was being forced to marry someone she did not want to marry. And so that did happen. Oh, and one other thing I wanted, I just, I was reading about um, the, the idea of theft, almost unknown amongst the Sioux, amongst themselves, except for one thing, and that was women. Oh. Not that it was acceptable to do, but it was done. And the only thing that you would ever hear of ever being stolen was somebody's wife. And so that, that was a cause of great uh, dissension within uh, the tribe sometimes. Uh, the morning rites or rituals, uh, both men and women would do this, but it was more frequently the women. Um, it was uh, very loud cries and wailing and moaning, screaming. Uh, they would cut their skin and even uh, sometimes cut off a finger. For a family member who was killed, and it was known that uh, some women uh, were missing a number of fingers because a number of their family had been killed for one reason or another. And of course, they would shave their heads as well. No, that's interesting. Using what? Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you. Uh, if they had knives from from white people, they would use that, but. Another way to cut your hair, to get it very short, is to burn it. Oh. And, and um, they would use, that. they could do it without burning themselves too much. But uh, yeah, this was, this was a common thing and, and to mourn the loss of a loved one. Uh, it's very common amongst men and women in many tribes uh, to burn your hair, singe it down to very close to your head. And, uh, and of course, uh, they were generally not buried. They would be put on these 
uh, platforms, sometimes in the middle of the village, or right next to the village, or you know, fairly close to it. And that's where the body would stay. Not usually, no. Uh, there were, so they were always what about when the, you know, the, the carrion came? So they would try to keep the vultures and stuff away, but you know, if nobody's around to do it, uh, out of sight, out of mind. I mean, they're going to do what they're going to do. Uh, the purification ritual is also really fascinating, and there's there's many different forms of this. But out on the Great Plains, the most common one. Um, uh, was called the sun dance. And the reason for this, I, I used to think some years ago, I, I would think of this in terms of the, the coming of age ceremony for young boys, uh, but it wasn't. I mean, it, it could have been used that way, but it was more a purification ritual, uh, which would mean uh, any man uh, could do this a number of times. It was always voluntary. You didn't have to do this. And it was mentioned that Crazy Horse, one of the great warriors of all time, never did this. He fasted, uh, but he never went through these uh, terrible tor self-torturing uh, rituals that many other men did. So um, the way you do this is to cut into your chest and stick uh, leather thongs in there. You tie it to a stick, a tall stick in the ground, and you lean back. That is the more tame version. <laughs> Among the mandans, uh, it was even more severe. You were uh, to fast for three days, um, and then you were to have these cut into your chest, and you were to be strung up uh, a few feet off of the floor of your, uh, of your hut. Uh, and, um, and then you were also have uh, cuts in your arms and legs, and uh, tied to that would be like buffalo skulls. So you could have strings attached to your arms and your legs with buffalo skulls on it. And when you are strung up, then they spin you around. And you're, you're not up there for very long, uh, but then they let you down, and then you are to run out, and there's like a, a trap, a course, a big circle that you are to run around. And as you were dragging these buffalo skulls, uh, as you were running, uh, people run out and jump on the buffalo skulls <laughs> so that uh, it rips out of your skin. So that was the man dance. The Sioux didn't do that extreme. Uh, but uh, so this is a look at the sun dance. So here's a guy leaning back, and there's this big stick in the ground. And you, you do that for some time. You're supposed to get some sort of vision from this. And this is after <laughs> fasting as well. And then here's the other variation among the uh, mandans and, and other tribes who do this. Yeah. And it is still practiced today. So uh, apparently they have they hold like a feather or something in their mouth. Yeah, maybe. Um, so now I, I wanted to come to uh, the names again, because there's so many fascinating names. And again, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's so thought provoking when you hear uh, some of these names of Native Americans and you think, why would they be named this? What was, there was a, a, always a particular reason. It's not just made up. There's always a good reason for you to be called what you are called. Um, when I was doing this a few nights ago, I thought, you know, I don't know what my name means. Mm -hmm. I knew that David, you know, a Jewish name, uh, mm -hmm. means beloved, and I've known that for a long time. Uh, but my last name is Holman, and I thought, I wonder why my ancestor was first called Holman. And I, I, first I thought, well, it could be like I am a whole man, uh, but that's not right because it doesn't have a W in front of it. And then I thought, well, maybe use a hole in the ground. Somebody did that. It's like, I hope not. So, so anyway, I looked, I looked it up, and apparently 
Uh, I have an ancestor who was a priest. He was a holy man. Oh. So that's much better. Uh, You're not holy enough, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he had kids, so. <laughs> okay, so here's some of the Sioux names that I came across. Look at this. Old man afraid of his horses. <laughs> and he had a son. Young man afraid of his horses. Well, Isn't awesome. that great? Uh, high backbone. A uh, white man runs him. So you kind of wonder, is it because he ran away from a, a white man? Or maybe he was chasing after a white man, or maybe a white man told him what to do. Who knows? But it, yeah, white man runs him, and that's his name. Touch the clouds. He was a tall one. Yes, that one you can figure out. Encouraging bear. Isn't that nice? To be a big bear. Yeah, maybe he's a big huggy type of guy. Sounds like the Care Bears, doesn't it? Encouraging bear. Hey, look at this. Black twin and white twin. Guess what they were? Twins. They were twins. One of them's called black twin, the other one's called white twin. Bad soup. Bad soup. He was probably choking on some soup and something like that. And here's a man named Old She Bear. He was probably very protective of his children, I would guess. Uh, and this one, women's dress. Hmm. A man in a very machoistic society is named women's dress. Hmm. Uh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> now, I don't know. That's the thing. And these are just names I come across. I'm reading about uh, you know, the history, and they, come across, and they name these guys doing such and such, and they talk to this guy or did, they did that guy, and, uh, but there's no explanation given, usually. Every once in a while there is. Um, but this guy, now this is the name you would want in a very macho society. Uh, my name is Bloody Knife. Nice to meet you. And I have a few women names here. They are afraid of her. Isn't that great? So this is, this is actually the daughter of Crazy Horse. So you know why they are afraid of her. Pretty Shield. That's nice. And Pretty Owl, mm -hmm. uh, Black Buffalo Woman, and Buffalo Cat <coughs> Road Woman. <coughs> Can't really imagine why that would be. But, uh, um, and there's another one that just uh, I just came across, uh, Ear of Corn. <laughs> so she was probably, he probably, uh, you know, a man saw her, and she's as cute as an ear of corn. <laughs> That's what I would think. Anyway. She had fluffy hair. <coughs> Okay, so now we're getting into European contact. Um, it was the Cree Indians who were their neighbors in uh, Minnesota who first got guns. And so that's why many of the Sioux left Minnesota, because the Cree hunted them down like uh, animals and killed quite a few. And so uh, they had to leave. And this is in the 1660s. And some of them are now just starting to migrate out onto the plains. Uh, they themselves started getting guns in the early to mid 1700s. Uh, and this is from traders uh, going up and down the Mississippi. Uh, and once they started getting guns, they would do the same thing. Uh, they would be the dominant tribe, kicking other tribes out of their way out onto the plains. So, I put this up as a generalized idea of where the Lakota were uh, around about 1800. Uh, this is, of course, not precise. And, and they never would have considered themselves as being bound by anything at this point. Uh, but this is generally where they were. And if you look at this territory, I mean, it's larger than North and South Dakota put together. And we're only talking about, in 1800, just the Lakota Sioux, and probably only about 8,000 people. So it's a huge territory uh, for just a few. And as I mentioned before, if you are a hunter-gatherer society, 
You cannot live in a small area. You have to have vast amounts of territory uh, because you can't hunt in the same place all the time. You have to travel. You have to uh, allow for the herds to replenish themselves. So you need a huge territory. Now we're going to jump forward. The first great treaty uh, with the whites uh, was in 1851. And this was one of the great gatherings out on the plains at Fort Laramie in Wyoming. Somewhere around 10,000 uh, Indians gathered together uh, to hear what the white man has to say. Now, 1851, we all know what has just happened in American history. What is it? Okay, talking about uh, what the, uh, the Plains Indians and what would affect them most that has just happened just previous to 1851. The gold rush. Now, generally speaking, when people first started coming out along the Oregon Trail in the 1840s, they were usually not bothered by any of the tribes. The tribes are usually too busy fighting amongst themselves and might think of the travelers as friendly and they might trade with them, uh, but they generally left them alone. But in 1849, we have the gold rush, and it's just, it's not just a few people coming across the plains anymore. It's a, yeah, it's a lot of people coming across the plains. And so the, the various tribes are now noticing, and, uh, and they don't like it. Too many of these white people are coming across our lands and hunting our game. Even though they're passing through, this is not something we like. So, uh, that, so this is the, the impetus for the treaty. Um, so many different tribes, Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Arikara, and Assiniboine, I think we're calling it, Mandan, Minturese, Blackfeet, Shoshones, Crows, are all there.